you know that for the 42 and a half years I was pastor here, I was a doctrinaire. And I already had a full eight years of ministry history as a doctrine master. So doctrine is of critical importance to me. Ireside. How many of you noticed that? I was asked this morning, do you want to to open it up and put an F in there? I said, no. (laughs) I have no interest at all in having an F in there. This is the explanation. How many of you ever saw that slide before? I actually had it in one presentation I did. Just one. And I only had it on the screen for maybe two or three seconds tops. And when it was off the screen and the video was on me, I said, if you saw it, you saw it. If you didn't, you missed it. But there are things that irritate me. I know that's a surprise to all of you. (laughs) Just stunning revelation. Well, I know there are things that irritate you too. But this uh, last couple of years have been very difficult for me because I've learned a, a lesson that it's easy for people to learn doctrine and not learn character. I know people, I have been one, who was very, very proud of the fact that I had truth. and yet was finding it difficult to get people to believe what I could prove. And that's because I was a a man with a bad attitude. When the Lord first started correcting me about that, I've only got 65 slides, so don't panic. Okay, you know. I can do 30 an hour, so don't worry that we we'll... I created a lesson for the first lesson in my Bible study series. It was called Degrees of Illumination. How many of you remember that? Degrees of Illumination. You know why there are so many different Christian sects, groups, That's because everyone that went before got something wrong. That's a fact. And a segment of Christianity that was in that original group, they learned something that the group didn't have. And so they started focusing on that thing they learned and instead of considering it an increase of illumination, it became the illumination and everything they had before became dark. And that's wrong. But that has been the history of Christianity for 2,000 years. We learn something new and we find out it's important And because the others don't have it, that becomes our emphasis. We want them to have it. But because they don't have it, they're in darkness. No, they're in the light you had before you got this new one. And if you tell them you're in darkness, they reject you. Because they know they're not in darkness. They remember having been in darkness. And you tell them that 25 watts of light that you've got is nothing. They know you're wrong. 
then you're something wrong with your character that allows you to disavow the truth that others have because you've got one they don't have. You know, we are in a movement, as it's called, in one of the organizations in this movement that got a renewed understanding of who Jesus really is. Christendom had lost it. And we thought that, well, we got it back in the early 1900s. No, you'd be surprised to know that the state of Pennsylvania was founded by a man whose fundamental doctrine was that there is no such thing as a trinity, but that Jesus Christ is the physical manifestation of the one true God. 1600s. The great awakening that took place starting in this town in 1751 had nothing to do with the Trinitarian preach who got credit. Nothing. It had nothing to do with him. I, I know, I, I got to read the two pertinent documents and I've talked to librarians who are the directors of the Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale and at Dartmouth, and they both know of one of those documents, but they don't have copies of it. And that was a document written by one of the deacons of the Enfield Congregational Church. Its pastor was named Peter Reynolds, R-A-Y-N-O-L-D-S. His grandson changed their last name to Reynolds. So if you look him up, it's Peter Reynolds, but it was Peter Reynolds. He pastored just down Route 5. That building burned down. They built another one, and it was destroyed. Now the Enfield Congregational Church is the building that houses that congregation, and they've got a plaque on their foyer porch that identifies in 1750s, so on, Peter Reynolds was the pastor. The other document I read was a letter written by Jonathan Edwards, who preached in that congregational church the message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You ever heard of that one? That's the one that's credited for sparking this massive revival. And when I say massive revival, the bars closed. The brothels shut down. The churches filled up. That's kind of indicative of a change in society, isn't it? Not something that can be legislated by government. Our government tried it in the prohibition years. Every law is designed to try and impose some kind of morality, but there were no laws passed. It was just a work of the Spirit of God in the community. And Edwards explained what he did that morning. And they don't like to publicize that because Edwards was a hateful man. He pastored a church in Northampton, Massachusetts, and that congregation fired him because he believed and insisted that he was the only man qualified to judge who could and couldn't take communion. No character. And he had also wrong doctrine. But he had purchased an advertisement in a newspaper condemning Peter Reynolds. He preached against Peter Reynolds. You know why? 
because Peter Reynolds was one of the at least 40% of all congregational ministers in the United States in the mid-1700s who did not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, but who believed in the exclusive deity of Jesus Christ. And Edwards considered himself the greatest theologian in North America, and he was a staunch Trinitarian. So he went on a campaign to destroy Peter Reynolds. You know what Peter Reynolds did? I couldn't do it. I confess. He invited Jonathan Edwards to come preach. Had to have been a Holy Ghost inspiration. <laughs> so Edwards said he went into his files and he pulled out one of his earliest sermons and the one he considered to be the least theologically correct. And he went, he took it, and he deliberately never looked away from his notes and read it verbatim in a monotone voice. The deacon wrote, he never took his eyes off the bell rope, meaning his notes. And he was monotone and boring us. All of a sudden, this is the deacon writing, all of a sudden, the doors of our church swung open and our unchurched neighbors were getting out of their buggies and crawling on their hands and knees, crying out in repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Dozens. Seeing them crawling up the aisle, crying out in repentance to God, pricked our hearts. And we all started repenting before God. And that spread through all of New England, the Great Awakening. Bars closed, brothels closed, robbery, crime almost disappeared. People were treating each other rightly. That was a work of God. And it was God telling Jonathan Edwards something. You have nothing to do with this because those people that were crawling in on their hands and knees hadn't heard a word he said. And besides that, his message defames the character of Jesus Christ. Yeah. But Peter Reynolds glorified the Lord Jesus Christ as the everlasting and almighty God who became a man and gave his life to save us. That's quite a story, isn't it? But we today, we think, boy, we just got this brand new after all those Centuries of darkness. We, we got the light again. Yeah. Yeah, we're a little bit late. We did get light again. But it wasn't the first time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was another great awakening in 1880s. Did you know that? Here in Connecticut. The pastor's name was Horace Bushnell. How many of you heard that name? The main auditorium in Hartford is Bushnell Auditorium. He was a congregational pastor. And he had been accused of heresy by other congregational pastors because he didn't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, but he believed in the exclusive deity of Jesus Christ. And so they filed charges against him and he was taken before a tribunal of the congregational church. And after hearing his defense, the judges ruled 
to dismiss the case. They said, we cannot fault his biblical reasoning. And on August 8th, 1881, I think, Horace Bushnell was asked to preach the convocation of Harvard Divinity School's commencement exercises, graduation. He preached for three hours. I'm a really good guy. <laughs> and the three hours of his preaching was about the exclusive deity of Jesus Christ. I have that in print. That message. No, I'm not going to use it. And if I did, I'd have to abbreviate it. I'm planning on being done here by one o'clock. Is that okay, or would you prefer I go longer? <laughs> so we have light, and uh, our movement, so-called, got light that most of Christendom had lost. And we decided this light is not optional. This makes a difference. Our salvation is dependent on this truth. And that's why those leaders were willing to be excommunicated, put out of their churches because they didn't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. They said, well, we don't have a choice. And we've done our best to convince the churches of the error. But we fell into the trap of degrees of illumination. And because we're so focused on the truth that we've been given, we tend to think nobody else has got any. We've dismissed doctrines held by other churches because we can prove them wrong in one way they explain it. Hello. I'll tell you, don't you judge the doctrine of who Jesus is based on what preachers say. Because there are preachers who are deaf, dumb, and blind to the actual proof. So I get irritated because we can't explain our truth. We can't prove our truth. And it's not because it's not true. It's because the witness is faulty. Are you there? Is that showing up there? Yep. Oh, good. Just so you know, this is all a part of my stuff. So how can doctrinal proof be proven? How can the doctrinal truth be proven? Not proven to you, not proven to me, but proven to whoever examines it. How can it be? I'm, I'm no longer accepting students until I understand that they are willing to have a character change as well as an intellectual change and a spiritual change. Psalm 1611, if you want to stand for a scripture, this is your opportunity. My spinal cord stimulator is already buzzing really strong, and I'm not going to tempt it. So you forgive me for remaining seated. I'm standing on the inside. <laughs> Thou will show me the path of life. You know, it's not I'm going to find, it's thou wilt show me the path of life. 
in thy presence is fullness of joy. How much more joy is there than that? <laughs> At thy right hand there are pleasures for a day, for a week, for a month, for a lifetime, forever more. I have the feeling the psalmist may have had some experience that many of us haven't had. <laughs> but I want to testify to you today. He's the one who shows the path of life. In his presence, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And at his right hand or under his power are pleasures forevermore. Yes. Brother Cash, ask the Lord to bless us, please. Amen. You may be seated. Doctrinal truth cannot be proven by reliance on textual evidence. You can't prove doctrinal truth by the Bible. Don't mistake me. You're not going to prove it without the Bible. But how many people have seen it in Scripture and not been convinced? Because for textual evidence to have any positive effect, both the witness and the audience have to agree about the authority of the text. Yeah. And, you know, most of the world doesn't have any reason to believe the Bible. The validity of any text isn't established by the fact that you believe it's true. Okay. It's not established by the fact you're convinced it's true. Amen. It's not established by the fact that you believe you can prove that it's true. Amen. If any of that were possible, the whole world would be converted by now. Right. The issue becomes how to convert mere belief or even unbelief, disbelief, how to convert it into knowledge. I remind you, you cannot know a lie. You can know something is a lie. But for example, you will never know that seven times six equals How much? Oh, you can know that. You can't know what I answered on the multiplication tables test. 45. I argued with the teacher in front of the class. Adamantly, vehemently. I didn't call her stupid. I thought it. This is a teacher, she doesn't even know it's 7 times 60 for 45. My dad taught me these multiplication tables. That's a long story, I won't go into it. But you'll never know that 7 times 6 equals 45. You can believe it. I believed it. I believed it strong enough to defend it. To argue with the teacher. Vehemently argue with the teacher. And boy, Mrs. Gould, we left off the D when we spoke her name. In all honesty, the guys in the class, we all thought she must have been the model for the Wicked Witch of the West. She's probably the best teacher I ever had. 
But instead of getting upset with me and arguing with me, other than saying, no, that's wrong, she handed me a fresh piece of chalk and invited me to go to the blackboard and prove that 7 times 6 equals 45. So I did. I went up and I marked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And I did that 7 times. And then... In front of everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, forty, one. Uh, one, two, I must have missed some somewhere. You know, I got converted from a believer in a lie to one who knew the truth. You can believe a lie. But you can't know a lie. And when you know the truth, you're not going to be convinced that 7 times 6 equals 45. It's not going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean that you can believe a lie so strong that you can't be convinced. But that's a possibility. You can believe a lie so strongly that you refuse to be convinced. And that's commonly called insanity. I mean, uh, the bondage of belief. Okay. We need to convert people from belief to knowledge. For Christianity, the conversion from belief to knowledge does not come as a result of argument or apologia. You know... When I came into the church, debates were a big deal. Debates between one of the mainline church pastors and one of ours, you know. Debating over the, the Godhead issue. Is there a trinity or is Jesus the exclusive deity? And everybody would get excited about that. I never did. I didn't feel like fighting was a good way to convince. I, I actually heard the account of an eyewitness of one of them where the pastor of the Trinitarian church, they had a big, beautiful building in the center of town, was hosting a debate against the pastor of the Jesus named Pentecostal church on the outskirts of town on the other side of the railroad tracks, you know, a little shanty building, small congregation. And that pastor only had a third grade education. The pastor of the big church uptown had his PhD in divinity, you know. And he was first to speak, and he got up and he identified himself, you know, I'm pastor so-and-so of the first big name church, the big, you know, the big beautiful building uptown, and I have my PhD in divinity from such and such a seminary, and I've been in the ministry for these many years, and I'm, we're here tonight to settle an issue about the doctrine of the Trinity. My opponent over here, whose church is over there, he has a third grade education and a very small congregation. And they gave this apostolic pastor an opportunity to speak and he said, what my learned opponent has said is so true as far as his academic qualifications and the size of his congregation and yes, it's a fact that I only had the opportunity to get in the public education uh, three years of schooling because I had to go to the farm to tend the farm. However, I'll make this deal with all of you. For every Bible verse he quotes, I'll quote the one before it and after it. You know how many people got saved because of that debate? 
None. I've listened to debates, and everybody thinks somebody won. But not everybody believes the same one won. Arguments are not going to do it. Doctrinal studies are not going to do it. It comes only, this conversion comes only when the believers or the unbelievers experience what I call illumination. The light goes in. One of the scriptures says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. The interesting thing about it is a deep examination of the word entrance has the flavor of invasion. Meaning it might not go through a wide open door. (laughs) There might be a little conflict getting in. But when the word gets in, when it's the word of God that is given to you, then it gives light. It's an illumination. Praise the Lord. Thank you. I appreciate the support, Deb. Keep it up and maybe some of them will catch on. You know. I don't get offended. Okay. Christians must create opportunities for the unbelievers to experience illumination. Christ Jesus accomplished this in his lifetime on the earth through the use of two methods. I was never a wise teacher. You know, they say a wise teacher has two rules that he goes by. Number one, never teach everything you know. No, I'm not going to teach you the number two. No, I I always gave you number two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, and occasionally nine. Two methods the Lord used. I'm going to share both of them with you. How many of you know he made some converts? He had thousands that followed him at one point but he ended up with a dozen. And one of those was appointed to replace one. The secondary method. Everybody say secondary. This is not the primary method. This is the secondary method. Was the proof that he established prophetically and fulfilled. That proof is not altogether subjective, but it does have its subjective side to it. That sign that he promised to give prophetically was that he would raise himself from the dead three nights and three days after he was buried. Now, Brother Rita, it didn't say three nights and three days. I know it says three days and three nights and proves that the First was a night. And the evening and the morning are the day. And that's why it was the third day, not the third night. And of course, I've got all of this proven, so-called proven. I've got all of the biblical evidence that specifies the facts Christianity has no clue about the facts. Christianity can't prove the sign. And all over the world, Christianity is challenged to show three days and three nights between a Friday afternoon and a Sunday morning. You could tell, I get irritated about that one. The historical records reveal with astounding detail 
the fulfillment of the one sign Jesus said he would give. That's the sign of the prophet Jonah. And all of that detail is found in the second lesson of my series, The Timetable and the Truth. However, it is also not altogether objective, this proof. It's not altogether objective for those who are more driven by the subjective. This is at least one of the reasons why God came to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Because it's not altogether objective and it's certainly not altogether subjective. His primary method which is what my message this morning is about. That which he used to prove himself to be who and what he claimed to be. He made eight claims. Each one of them mean just one thing about him, that he is the one true everlasting and almighty God and that he became a man. He made eight claims that point that out. And the, all, the primary method he used to prove those claims was his living, his relating, his dying and resurrection according to the exact timetable, the exact schedule that he prophesied. Consider carefully this summary of the testimonies of the eyewitnesses of the fulfillment of that sign. Their testimonies have been preserved through 2,000 years of almost universal animosity to them. Nevertheless, they survive. You read it in 1 John 1. I'm going to read it to you. We're going to break it down a little bit. What time is it? Oh, good. Good. That which was from the beginning. Yeah, I have taught you here, haven't I? When you find a word beginning, you need to find out what it's the beginning of. You know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Was that the beginning? No. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word created everything that was created. So before the earth was created, there was the Word. That's an earlier beginning, isn't it? I have a question. You can answer it. You know the answer. Does God have a beginning? No. He doesn't have a beginning, you know. He just, you know, didn't not exist and then poof, come into existence. No. He is the I am. Not the I wasn't, but now I am. Uh, okay, anyway. That which was from the beginning. You know, that word from indicates motion. Once there, but not there now, but is from. I am from Indiana. Before that, I was from England. <laughs> I can take it all the way back to Aurora, Colorado. But I am not there anymore. And if I leave here, I'll be from the earth. 
happily. Yeah. From the beginning, whatever the beginning was, he was there and proceeded from it. You see that picture? Just a few words. You pay attention to what they say, you get a different view of the universe. That which was from the beginning, which we, everybody say we. Now, do you really believe that the Apostle John was so egotistical that he always used the royal we? Or is he saying, I'm not just speaking for me. I'm not just writing for me. I'm writing for the group of us who are eyewitnesses. That which we have heard, that's one of your senses, isn't it? It's an important one. I uh, considered becoming a roommate in off-campus housing for a blind student. I decided against it for two reasons. Number one, it was a little more expensive than I could afford. Number two, after having met him, he didn't need me. He was blind, but he knew where everything was. I asked him, how do you know what color shirt to wear with that pair of pants? He says, oh, I've got, I've got a little sewing And I can tell by the number of dots what the color is. I had never thought of that. You know, now, my dear brother Levi Wright is colorblind. He has a wife to help him. <laughs> I'm not colorblind, but I have a wife who helps me. The way she does it is, as we're ready to leave the house, she says, you're wearing that? <laughs> well, no, actually, I, I, was, I think I'll go change. <laughs> I picked this out. Did I do okay? I mean, a white shirt and a red tie and a black suit, it's hard to go wrong, <laughs> you know. <laughs> which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. One testimony in the ears, one testimony in the eyes, right? Which we have looked upon. Well, if you saw with your eyes, you know, you know, the words translated looked upon means to have examined closely, to actually have studied, looking closely, examining. We didn't just see him. Oh, yeah, there he is over there. No, we, we were up close and personal. And we watched him closely. And our hands have handled. You know, when I read this, I almost get jealous. But I've also seen him and heard him and got to examine him. And I've had a privilege of touching him. I'm not boasting or bragging anything like that, but I still read this and I get misty-eyed because I know what it's like. It changes your life. Yeah, we heard him. We saw him with our eyes. We stared and examined, and our hands have handled of the word of life. What he heard, what he saw, what he was able to examine in detail and what he was able to handle convinced him this is not just the son of Mary. This is the word of life. Yeah, that's pretty good stuff, isn't it? So far you're doing good, John. Yes, we blame it on the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. 
How is it possible for the life was manifested. How many of you know that every word's important? The articles, the prepositions, the adverbs, adjectives, verbs, and nouns, they're all important. If we were to set aside our assurance that God inspired John to write the words we've just read in this epistle. Even set it aside so much as to ignore it altogether. Our confidence that the words John wrote were inspired, given to him by the breath of God. If we just can set that aside altogether, we can't just set aside the personal testimony of the one who wrote it. <clears throat> and let's consider that testimony for a minute. The first declaration is in John's testimony is that the word of life is from the beginning. That's his first declaration. The word of life, which we heard which we saw, which we examined, which we handled with our hands. That word of life is from the beginning. John claimed that he and others heard with their own ears, saw with their own eyes, so much so that they were able to stare and closely look at him and even handle him with their own hands. And they were convinced that it was the word of life that they were hearing and seeing, examining, and handling. This is a personal testimony. You can deny hearsay all you want. But it's hard to deny the personal testimony, isn't it? But that never happened, but it did. I testified to it. My compadres, they testify to it. We were the ones that, it happened to me. You know, he went on, he explains that this was possible because the life was manifested. The Greek word translated manifested <clears throat> is defined by Thayer, in his lexicon, has become actual and visible to be realized. And the word realized there means as in not fictional, but real. Got it? The life was made visible realized. It became actual. It was taken out of theory. It was taken out of belief and made concrete and objective. So please notice that John uses the plurals we and us and he does it to declare that he was not the only witness but merely recording the testimonies of others as well as his own. And if you knew the history of what they all endured because of their testimonies, you would be hard-pressed to just dismiss it. Please also notice that the word of life is singular, not plural. Not words of life. Not a word, but the word of life. I also think it's worthy of note that the word of life is not limited to the masculine pronoun he. What do you mean by that, Brother Rio? Well, that which was manifested was the one from the beginning. 
And that transcendence one encompasses more than all gender can express. Is, does God think of himself as masculine? Yes, he does. Is there anything about feminine that he does not know altogether thoroughly? He's the one who made her. And she is, man is fearfully and wonderfully made. She is more wonderfully made and mysterious. So the witnesses are testifying that the transcendent deity was manifested. And the manifested deity became a male human being. You can read that in John 1, verse 14. And the word was made flesh. And what? We beheld. Yeah, his. This is not a sexist lesson. He became flesh. Back in 1 John 1, verse 2, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and bear witness and Ever say and? In addition to what? And. In addition to what? In addition to bearing witness. Hello? We have seen and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. We know that he wasn't manifested unto you. We know that. John was probably in his 90s. In fact, his epistles might have been written even after the book of Revelation. There's, I can't prove that, but there's some little trivial hints. But he was an old man when he wrote this. He said, I know that you weren't even alive when this happened. You know, it was manifested unto us. Well, we bear witness and show unto you what? That doctrinal truth? Hello? Now we show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was made real, actual to us. Somebody see it? Yeah. John and the other disciples of Jesus Christ who survived that crucifixion, whom John called we and us, experienced the same manifestation, the same making real. of the word of life. They all saw him. Even more significant, they all became witnesses unto him as truly being the word of life. But please, let's expand our understanding of what those words mean, bear witness. John gave the proper definition of what is meant by the words bear witness. They did more than tell us about what they experienced. They did more. They told us, but they did more. They demonstrated it. They showed it unto us. They made his living into an experiential reality 
for those to whom they communicated. They made the life, the living of Jesus Christ a reality to the people that they bear witness to. They live toward others the same kind of love he demonstrated to them. We got scripture. They heard him say these words. And when they discovered him to be the word of life, what he said became more than suggestions, more than commandments. They became motives. John 13, 35, Jesus said to them, I have given you an example that ye should do what feels right to you at the time. That ye should do what seemeth right. No. I've given you an example. You do what I have done. that ye should do as I have done to you. In John 13, 34, he said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. I think if you've read the Gospels, you understand that the way he loved them had nothing to do with warm, fuzzy feelings. John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. The followers of the Lord Jesus Christ lived toward others the same kind of love that he demonstrated to them. That's bearing witness. They not only spoke to people about the Lord Jesus Christ and his truth, but they proved the validity of that claim by living according to the demands it made upon them, transforming their beliefs, transforming their thinking, transforming their behavior, even toward those who chose to be hostile to them, enemies. Luke 6, 35, Jesus said, But love ye your enemies, and do good, and land hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. John's summary was that the witnesses did not live according to their own understanding of what was right, but they lived according to the example that they had heard and seen and examined and handled because they knew that is the life of the word of life. And they testified to others about all of his living, not about their own. That's what he said in 1 John 1, 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Please consider the reason 
that John gave on behalf of his fellow Christian witnesses. It reveals the true motive for evangelism. It's not so people can acknowledge that you're right and they were wrong. It's probably why John and his fellow disciples of Jesus Christ were so effective in spreading Christianity through the whole of the world in their lifetimes. It's back to the text. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That means more than pronounce. And why do we do it? That ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that we can feel gratified that we've proven to you that we were right. That the numbers on our Sunday school board will increase. That we will get a reputation as a growing congregation. That your tithes and offerings will make life a little better. Boy, if we eliminated those kinds of motives from preachers, churches might fill up. We do it that your joy might be full. The purpose of their desire to bring others into the fellowship was not to confirm their own beliefs. Well, if so many else agree with it, it can't be wrong. Yeah. Nor was it to enlarge their numbers, but to give other people the opportunity to experience the same fullness of joy that they had in hearing and seeing and examining and handling the word of life. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Where is this fullness of joy, this full joy to be found and experienced in a church building? In the company of other believers? What about in a monastery or a convent or some other secluded spiritual environment? Unfortunately, 2,000 years of proof that location and situations cannot accomplish it have not convinced Christians to change their ways. We use the same methods today that have been used since the early church passed away and left it to their offspring. Where do we get the idea of church buildings? Where do we get the idea of the great division between the ministry and the people? Where do we get our hierarchical authority structure in the church? Well, that's, that's the way Grandpa did it. Why did he do it? Oh, his grandpa did it that way. We can take it right back to Rome. No further. You can't find it in Jerusalem. Okay. No. What has failed for 2,000 years? We're still doing it, same way. You know what insanity is defined as? Yeah, doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result every time. Yeah. It should be apparent to us from the testimony of history and the testimony of John that this joy is only found in the actual living presence of the word of life. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. So what must we do in order to prove the truth? We must prove it the same way the Lord Jesus proved it, by demonstration. Our own living, how we love others and how we react to enemies. We must learn three things to deny ourselves, to take up the sacrifices imposed upon us by others, our cross, and follow him. That's the only way we can bring people into a circumstance in which they can encounter the living God. Matthew 16. I'm almost done. What slide is this? Hey, I only had 65 slides. So there's only eight more to go. That's not more than an hour. I promise. Matthew 16, 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if, what? Any man. Uh, ladies, I hate to tell you, that doesn't exempt you. Just, just so you know. Any human being is what it's talking about. But let's, let's say that it's, it we're somehow limited. Any man. Are there any men excluded? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In Mark 8, 34, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever, that's a little broader than any man, isn't it? <laughs> whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I know I recently said these three verses. And in Luke 9, 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I confess I've searched but I've never found any evidence that he ever changed those requirements or made an exemption for you. Trust me, I searched harder to find an exemption for me. I failed to find the exemption. Only when we obey his instructions will our evangelism have the power our Lord Jesus Christ intended it to have. Yeah. Psalm 1611. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Please stand. How to prove the truth. Well, if you just get smart enough to acknowledge you're dumb and ignorant and that I'm smart and right, then we'll do fine. That works wonderfully. Yeah, that ensures that Christianity will be a shrinking percentage of the world population every year to come. Oh, but our numbers are growing. We've got more people in our congregation now than we did 10 years ago. Wonderful. You have had no impact on your community. Where are the bar closings? Where is the demise of the sex trade? Where is human trafficking no longer taking place? 
Why is the divorce rate so high? But it's lower than it used to be. Yeah, that's because people aren't getting married anymore. They're just living together. Hard to get a divorce when you're never married. You know, Why are we not having an impact on our society? Because we aren't proving the truth. We have to live it. Can anybody say amen to that? All right, Brother Phil, close us with prayer. You're here, right?